I really feel honored, honored to follow uh, Wafa Sultan, a fellow physician. Um, I, uh, I was inspired by something actually uh, uh, Pamela said. Uh, it was a very profound, very profound statement Pamela made this morning. Um, where she said, I don't worry about the, if I'm quoting accurately, I don't worry about the fanaticism of the enemy, I worry about our confusion. And I'm going to talk about, uh, a lot of my talk is going to be about essentially the Pied Piper of Islamic confusion and a, and a tragically influential, influential one. And in medicine we have this practice, it's a very noble practice, it's a mea culpa based education practice called morbidity and mortality review. And basically, we try and understand how patient care scenarios somehow went awry. And I think our entire generation must very quickly undergo a process vis-a-vis -vis Islam uh, like that. If, if, if future generations are simply to survive, I don't mean to be so melodramatic about it, but that's the point we're at. And I'd start with this very simple premise. Uh, it might sound familiar to, to some of you. Uh, Baldurizing Islam is the, is the problem. Honesty about Islam uh, is, is the solution. <laughs> Colonel Douglas McGregor is a respected military strategist who was a heroic tank commander uh, during the 1991 Iraq War. Um, as the General McChrystal scandal broke, if you guys remember that, in, in 2010, Colonel McGregor, who attended West Point with McChrystal and was angered by the U.S. military's disastrous Iraq and Afghanistan nation-building efforts, commented accurately, here's what he said, the idea that we are going to spend a trillion dollars to reshape the culture of the Islamic world is utter nonsense, unquote. Successfully lobbying for that miserably failed utopianism was accompanied, accompanied, accomplished by balderizing Islam, indeed mind slaughtering it, a, a powerful term I will introduce. My discussion will identify the ultimate source of gravitas for that balderization process and key elements of the Islam, not Islamism, not radical Islam, uh, that were balderized. Tuesday, August 2nd, you may have seen this. Kaiser Khan, who achieved notoriety for his condemnation of Donald Trump at the Democratic National Convention, had the, had the temerity to tell Anderson Cooper, quote, I do not stand for any Sharia law because there is no such thing, except when he, Khan, notes it does exist, as in his 1983 essay published in the Houston Journal of International Law, and it was called Juristic Classification of Islamic Law, which used the word Sharia eight times in that essay alone, including this particular usage. Quote, all other juridical works which have been written during more than 13 centuries are very rich and indispensable, but they must always be subordinated to the Sharia, from a man who says there is no Sharia. CNN's Anderson Cooper did not even challenge Khan's mendacious, self-contradictory assertion, let alone follow up on Khan's effusive written praise of two prominent modern global Sharia promoting ideologues, Saeed Ramadan, who was, who was the um, son-in-law of Hassan al-Banna, the founder of the Muslim Brotherhood, and A.K. Brohi, who was an ideologue uh, in the era of Zia al-Haq, the, the fundamentalist dictator of Pakistan. Uh, and, and when you read these essays, it's very clear that Khan is supporting so-called Sharia-based human rights. Uh, the Khan-Cooper exchange illustrates starkly the contemporary equivalent of what the great chronicler of Soviet communist mass murder, Robert Conquest, who died recently, appositely characterized as mind slaughter, a brilliantly evocative term for delusive Western apologetics regarding the ideology of communism and the tangible horrors its communist votaries inflicted. Conquest decried those numerous Western intellectuals or near intellectuals of the 1930s to the 1950s whose willful delusions about the Soviet Union, I love this line, will be incredible to later students of mental aberration, unquote. <laughs> he, he, he observed, one role of the democratic media is of course to criticize their own governments and draw attention to the faults and failings of, our, of their own country. But, when this results in a transfer of loyalties to a far worse and thoroughly inimical culture, or at least to a largely uncritical favoring of such a culture, it becomes a morbid affliction, involving often enough the uncritical acceptance of that culture's own standards." Unquote. His critique of Western media highlights a cultural self-loathing tendency which has persisted and intensified over the intervening decades and is now manifest in the balderized public discussion of Islam. Tragically, such mind-slaughtered Islamic discourse 
extends to an iconic figure in conservative punditry on Islam, while the impact of this doyen's policymaking advice has been disastrous. Samuel Huntington acknowledged his indebtedness to Bernard Lewis's 1990 essay, The Roots of Muslim Range, for Huntington's book title, The Clash of Civilizations. Lewis, as Huntington notes, in 1990 had pronounced, quote, this is no less than a clash of civilizations that perhaps irrational but surely historic reaction of an ancient rival against our Judeo-Christian heritage, our secular present, and the worldwide expansion of both, unquote. Oracle-like font of Islamic wisdom to a large swath of conservative policymaking elites, Bernard Lewis added this caveat, quote, it is, it is crucially important that we on our side should not be provoked into an equally historic but also equally irrational reaction against that rival. Think about those words. Despite his own morally equivocating advice, Lewis himself convinced the Bush II administration to pursue what became known aptly as the Lewis Doctrine, which was not only an irrational but a catastrophic response to the eminently rational Islamic doctrine of jihad. Peter Waldman's methodical, well-sourced February 3rd Wall Street Journal investigative report, it was called A Historian's Take on Islam, Steers U.S. and Terrorism Fight, Bernard Lewis's Blueprint, Sowing Arab Democracies, Facing a Test in Iraq. So it's pretty clear what he was talking about. Stands as important confirmation of the overarching ideology which spurred the March 3rd, 2000 Iraq invasion. Waldman meticulously documented how Lewis exerted profound influence in shaping the Bush II administration's Islamic democracy agenda invading Iraq being the sine qua non manifestation of this Lewis doctrine. Lewis, as Waldman notes, began evangelizing his doctrine to the highest level Bush II administration officials just over a week after 9-11, accompanied significantly by the late Ahmed Chalabi, who turns out is probably a likely vector of Iranian influence. This is from the Wall Street Journal. Eight days after the September 11th uh, attacks, the Pentagon still smoldering, Mr. Lewis addressed the U.S. Defense Policy Board. Mr. Lewis and a friend, Iraqi exile Ahmed Chalabi, argued for military takeover of Iraq to avert still worse terrorism in the future. Call it the Lewis Doctrine. Mr. Lewis's diagnosis of the Muslim world's malaise and his call for a U.S. military invasion to cede democracy in the Mideast. As mentor and informal advisor to some top U.S. officials, Mr. Lewis has helped coax the White House to shed decades of thinking about Arab regimes and the use of military power. Gone is the notion that U.S. policy in the oil-rich region should promote stability. Above all, even if it means taking tyrants as friends. Also gone is the extraordinary notion that fostering democratic values in these lands risks destabilizing them. Instead, the Lewis Doctrine says fostering Mideast democracy is not only wise, but imperative, unquote. Waldman also demonstrated how Lewis successfully indoctrinated the ultimate Bush II administration leadership to pursue his utopian design, including President Bush himself, Dick Cheney, and most likely Condoleezza Rice. I contend, after careful review, that the miserably failed Lewis Doctrine was a sham castle of dangerous, mind-slaughtered misrepresentations built upon four pillars, dimitude denial, Islamic Jew hatred denial, Sharia obstruction, and Lewis's own inexplicable volt fast, 180 degree reversal on his gimlet-eyed 1950s assessment of Islamic totalitarianism and Haria, the Islamic antithesis of Western freedom. Regarding the imposition of the Dhimma, Islam's humiliating pact of submission for non-Muslims per Quran 929, so the ninth surah, the 29th verse, and the alleged absence of theological Jew hatred in Islam, Lewis made these oracular, if vacuous, and counterfactual summary pronouncements across three decades. So 1974, here's what he said about the Dhimma. The Dhimma, on the whole, worked well. The non-Muslims managed to thrive under Muslim rule and even to make significant contributions to Islamic civilization. The restrictions were not onerous and were usually less severe in practice than in theory as long as the non-Muslim communities accepted and conformed to the status of tolerated subordination assigned to them, they were not troubled. That, 1984, in Islamic society, hostility to the Jew is non-theological. It is not related to any specific doctrine nor to any specific circumstance in Islamic history. For Muslims, it is not part of the birth pangs of their religion as it is for Christians. 2006, doubling down. Dimmi, and it's sort of derisively hyphenated, he spells it D-H-I-M-M-I -M -M in quotes, dash tood, 
Subservience and persecution and ill treatment of Jews is a myth. Shlomo Dov Goitain, who died in 1985, unlike Lewis, was a historian who specialized, he actually specialized, in the study of Muslim-non-Muslim relations. Goitain, whose seminal research findings were widely published in, in this massive 25-year uh, project uh, called the Mediterranean Society, Jewish Communities of the Arab World, etc. It took 25 years to compile this and probably 10 more years of research before it was even compiled. He was emeritus professor at Hebrew University and actually a Lewis colleague at the uh, Institute for Advanced Study in Princeton. When Goitain died in 1985, the Times, New York Times obituary uh, noted that uh, his, his work on Muslim-non-Muslim relations were, quote, standard works for scholars in both fields. Contra Lewis's uninformed whitewash drivel, and that's really what it is. Here is, here is what Goitain wrote on the subject of non-Muslim dimmies under Muslim rule, that is the dimma covenant that Lewis was extolling. Uh, this is what Goitain wrote in 1970, quote, the Muslim state was quite the opposite of the ideals propagated by the principles embedded in the Constitution of the United States. An Islamic state was part of or coincided with Darul Islam, the House of Islam. Its treasury was Mal al Muslimin, the money of the Muslims. Christians and Jews were not citizens of the state, not even second class citizens. They were outsiders under the protection of the Muslim state, a status characterized by the term Dimma, for which protection, actually that's protection against the resumption of the jihad, uh, they had to pay a poll tax specific to them. They were also exposed to a great number of discriminatory and humiliating laws. As it lies in the very nature of such restrictions, soon additional uh, humiliations were added, and before the second century of Islam was out, a complete body of legislation in this matter was in existence. In times and places in which they became too oppressive, they led to the dwindling or even complete extinction of the minorities." Unquote. The legacy of Islamic anti-Semitism, my own exhaustive treatise, included voluminous materials Lewis never bothered to compile, let alone analyze with comparable honesty. Uh, my careful analyses demonstrated that the Quran, its classical and modern exegesis by Islam's greatest commentators, and the traditions of Muhammad and the, and the nascent Muslim community are rife with virulent conspiratorial Jew-hating motifs that have been acted upon by Muslims vis-a-vis -vis Jews across space and time, from the advent of Islam till now. The, and I'm gonna summarize some of this for you. The Quran's overall discussion of the Jews is marked by a litany of their sins and punishments as if part of a divine indictment, conviction, and punishment process. Presently, Al-Azhar Quranic litanies of 20 to 25 verses describing fixed negative traits of the Jews are popular, widely disseminated, and endorsed in the writings and public statements of this Vatican of Sunni Islam's last two papal equivalents, the late Grand Imam Tantawi and current Grand Imam Al-Tayeb. So Al-Azhar is essentially the Sunni Vatican of religious education. The Grand Imams are the Sunni Vatican equivalents of the popes. Such Jew-hating Quranic highlights include Jews as prophet killers updated in the Hadith, the traditions of Muhammad, to include Muhammad himself, uh, allegedly poisoned to death by a Jewish, by a Jewess, I'm sorry, at a Jewish conspiracy, while the Shiite Hadith further hold the Jews responsible for the deaths of Ali, the fourth rightly guided caliph and, and, and uh, disseminator of the Shiite line, uh, and his son Hussein, meriting permanent debasement and humiliation. That's Quran 263 and 3112, so chapter verse. Um, Jews as apes or apes and pigs, that's Quran 265, 560, 7166, a Quranic epithet Muhammad personally directed at the Jews, according to the early biographies of Muhammad, before the Muslims subdued, uh, and he personally slaughtered by beheading uh, all the post-pubescent males, some 700 to 900, of the Jewish tribe Banu Qurayza, Jews as inveterate conspirators against Islam. So it's like the ancient Quranic antecedent of the Protocols of the Elders of Zion. That's Quran 564 who harbor the greatest enmity toward the Muslim creed. That's Quran 582. The Jews' ultimate sin and punishment are made clear in the Quran. They are the devil's minions. That's Quran 451 and 60. Cursed by Allah, their faces will be obliterated. That's Quran 447. Uh, and if they do not accept the true faith of Islam, uh, I found this mildly humorous, but anyway, the Jews who understand their faith become Muslims. That's Quran 3113. 
if they don't do this, they will be made into apes again, or apes and pigs, and burn in the hellfires, and there's a series of verses which reflect that. Uh, a brilliant, scrupulously documented 1937 essay in French, which Lewis certainly had access to, uh, by rabbi and Islamic scholar Georges Vida on the Hadith. These, again, the traditions of Muhammad. Um, it, it, I, I was happy to be able to translate this and bring this into English. It's, it's a magnificent uh, uh, essay. It's the first time it was in English. Demonstrated that stubborn malevolence uh, is the Jews' defining worldly characteristic in these traditions. Rejecting Muhammad and refusing to convert to Islam out of jealousy, envy, and even selfish personal interest led them to acts of treachery in keeping with their inveterate nature. And he summarizes, sorcery, poisoning, assassination held no scruples for them, the Jews. These archetypes sanctioned Muslim hatred towards the Jews and the admonition to at best subject the Jews to Muslim domination as dhimmis treated with contempt under certain humiliating arrangements. Vida's research on the Hadith further illustrate how Sunni Muslim end of times uh, theology emphasizes the Jews' supreme hostility toward Islam. Jews are described as adherents of the Dijal or the Dajjal, which is the Muslim equivalent of the Antichrist. And per other traditions, the Dajjal is in fact Jewish. When the Dajjal is defeated, his Jewish companions will be slaughtered, everything will deliver them up uh, except for the so-called Garkad tree. You've probably heard this hadith repeated. Uh, thus, according to several uh, canonical hadith, Muhammad himself reportedly declared, if a Jew seeks refuge under a tree or a stone, those objects will be able to speak to tell a Muslim, quote, there is a Jew behind me, come and kill him. Vida also emphasizes how the notion of jihad war ransom extends even into Islamic end of times theology. He says, not only are the Jews vanquished in the eschatological war, the end of times war, but they will serve as ransom for the Muslims in the hellfires. The sins of certain Muslims will weigh on them like mountains, but on the day of resurrection, these sins will be lifted and laid upon the Jews. Lastly, uh, again, sort of morbidly funny, a profound anti-Jewish and racist motif, so it's both, put forth in early uh, Muslim, uh, Sunni Muslim historiography, as well as Shiite Hadith li literature, is most assuredly contra Lewis, a part of the, quote, birth pangs of Islam. And this is the story of Abdallah uh, bin Saba, an alleged re renegade Yemenite Jew, and per Sunnis, founder of the Shiite sect. Sunnis held him responsible identified as a black, so there's the racist motif, Jew, for promoting the Shiite heresy and fomenting the political rebellion and internal strife, uh, Shi Sunni versus Shiite, uh, assassination of Caliph Uthman, etc. That, that's, that's the Jews' fault. Um, but how do the Shiites deal with this? Well, authoritative Shiite authors claim this identifiably black Jew, once again, anti-Semitic and racist, was guilty of perverting and warping the message of of Caliph uh, Ali's true followers, so the Shiites. Uh, mainstream Shiites just uh, designated Abdullah ibn Salah uh, as somehow promoting extreme heretical beliefs uh, in Shiism for which Caliph Ali uh, had ibn Saba burned alive, and that's in the Shiite Hadith. The entirety of this ugly Islamic doctrine, shared with minimal variation by Sunni and Shiite Islam alike, begot chronic grinding oppression interspersed with outbursts of violence, including sporadic mass murderous pogroms, which affected Jewish communities in Palestine, Yemen, Egypt, Libya, Tunisia, and even mythically tolerant Muslim Spain to the west, as well as Turkey to the north and Iraq and Iran to the east. Modern Zionism, culminating in the reestablishment of Israel, governed by Jews, fully liberated from 13 centuries of jihad-imposed dimitude in their ancestral homeland, has reinvigorated Islam's annihilationist strains of Jew hatred. During a Pew Forum interview, April uh, 27, 2006, uh, Bernard Lewis opined rather defensively about the Sharia, Islam's religio-political law. This is what he says. When we talk of Muslim law, I would remind you that, that, you, that we are talking about law. Sharia is a system of law and adjudication, not of lynching and terror. It is a law that lays down rules, rules for evidence, for indictment, for defense, and the rest of it. Quite a different matter from what has been happening recently, unquote. But Lewis doesn't elaborate on those rules or any of the elements of Sharia, which, which makes it so noxious. I will, briefly. The Sharia Islam's canon law is traceable to Quranic verses and edicts as further elaborated in the Hadith. Uh, 
and it's codified into rulings by Islam's greatest allegists. Sharia is a retrogressive development compared with the evolution of clear distinctions between ritual, the law, moral doctrine, good customs in society, etc., within Western European Christendom. And it is utterly incompatible with the conceptions of human rights enshrined in the U.S. Bill of Rights. Liberty crushing and dehumanizing Sharia sanctions, open-ended jihadism to subjugate the world to a totalitarian Islamic order, and of course that's done by terror. Muhammad says, I have been made victorious uh, through terror. Rejection of bed bedrock Western liberties, including freedom of conscience and speech, enforced by imprisonment, beating, or death. Discriminatory relegation of non-Muslims to outcast vulnerable pariahs, and even Muslim women to subservient chattel. And, and barbaric punishments which violate human dignity, such as amputation for theft, stoning to death for adultery, and lashing for alcohol consumption. Compounding these fundamental and freedom, uh, freedom and dignity abrogating iniquities, matters of procedure under Islamic law are antithetical to Western conceptions of the rule of law. Evidentiary proof is, is non-existent by Western legal standards. And the Sharia doctrine of siyasa, government or administration, grants wide latitude to the ruling elites, rending, rendering permissible arbitrary threats, beatings, and imprisonments of defendants to extract confessions, particularly from so-called dubious suspects. Clearly, Sharia standards, which do not even seek evidentiary confessions while sanctioning explicit, blatant legal discrimination against women and non-Muslims, are intellectually and morally inferior to the antithetical concepts which underpin Western law. In light of the still raging 2006 Danish cartoons controversy regarding the crime of blaspheming Islam's prophet, uh, specifically, thus spake Lewis, the Islamic Yoda of our generation, circa April 2006, quote, the jurists on the whole tend to take a rather mild view of this offense. Really, Karl Brockelmann, the renowned scholar of Semitic languages and arguably the foremost Orientalist of his generation, made these candid observations in 1939 about the Sharia's injunctions pertaining to penal law in general and so-called blasphemy and apostasy, specifically Islamic law being valid eternally and all too widely applied in Brockelman's era through the present. The penal code of Islam has remained on a rather primitive level. Blasphemy with respect to Allah, the prophet, and his predecessors is punished by death, as is defection from Islam if the culprit persists in his disbelief. Consider the modern views on blasphemy articulated by the late Ayatollah Montazeri, gushingly championed by fervent Lewis acolytes Michael Adin and Rule Garek, and deemed the enlightened spiritual godfather of the so-called Iranian Green Movement. The good Ayatollah adhered rigorously to the traditionalist Shiite dogma on sab, or blasphemy, instant lethal punishment of the offender. Here's what he said. In cases of Saab al-Nabi, blasphemy against a, a prophet, particularly Muhammad, if the witness does not have fear of his or her life, it is obligatory for him or her to kill the insulter. Rising restrictions on religion, a report by Pew, issued August 2011, examined the issue of defamation of religion, tracking countries where various penalties are enforced for apostasy, blasphemy, or criticism of religions. While such laws are sometimes promoted as a way to protect religion in practice, they often serve to punish religious minorities whose beliefs are deemed unorthodox or heretical. Um, okay, I'm going to have to accelerate things here. Uh, <laughs> I've just been given the word. Um, it, what's, what's so striking about all this is that, is that in the 1950s there was a whole different Lewis. He basically wrote an entry uh, showing, describing how Haria the Islamic concept of freedom is antithetical to the Western conception of freedom. He, he wrote a beautiful essay called Islam and Communism where he, he showed that they were strikingly uh, the same. Um, and yet, in, it, 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 not only in terms of going into Iraq, he was doubling down as, as late as 2006 and, and once again after the miserably failed uh, Arab Spring, which I called springtime for Sharia in Arabi. Um, <laughs> Uh, he, 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 would, he would say things like, bring them freedom or they destroy us, knowing full well that, that, that the concept of freedom was, was, was antithetical uh, in, in Islam. Um, and he, he appeared to have, have infected uh, uh, former President Bush with this, with this same ideology, uh, because in 2012, again, 
Bush was hectoring critics who didn't agree with, with, the, with, the, with his uh, ebullient assessment of the uh, Arab Spring phenomenon, and, he, and Bush said this, some look at the risks inherent in democratic change, particularly in the, in the Middle East and North Africa, and find the dangers too great. America, they argue, should be content with supporting the flawed leaders uh, they know in the name uh, of stability. And, and Bush said, that's all wrong. That's all wrong. And that, and that, in fact, the Arab Spring was, quote, the broadest challenge to authoritarian rule since the collapse of Soviet communism. Um, so, in conclusion, far more important than mere hypocrisy, which is a ubiquitous human trait, is the catastrophic legacy of his own Islamic negationism Bernard Lewis has bequeathed to Western policymaking elites. And that's where the mea, that's where the mea culpa based reassessment of things really needs to, needs to start, in my humble opinion. Thank you very much.